Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a case study in how we should be doing theoretically based task analyses of practice activities, the rondo in soccer. Will this activity achieve its goals? Is it representative? Does it foster creativity and functional variability? Will it transfer to competition? My interview with Carl Marius Axum. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. Today, my guest is Carl Marius Axum. Uh, Thanks for joining me, Carl. Thanks so much for having me, Robert. And so what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about your work you did on doing a, a, a practice activity analysis in soccer or football, <laughs> um, depending where you are. Um, but before we get into that, what I want to ask, can you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of wh- what you're working on now? Sure. Um, I have, um, I'm 32 years old. I'm uh, now a head coach of a junior elite team in Norway uh, for one of the biggest clubs in Norway, Odd, Odd Sport Club. Um, and uh, I have a long, uh, uh, I did a, long uh, what you call um, I have a couple of degrees from the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences so I did my bachelor there in football coaching my master's in coaching and psychology and then I did my PhD on uh, visual perception in elite football uh, from from an ecological point of view so Mm -hmm. a lot of James Gibson and uh, direct perception and uh, so uh, yeah that's my background. And then uh, after I defended my PhD, which uh, included the Rondo defense, um, then I moved here uh, to Shen. So now I'm a full-time football coach, and that's that's where my ambition lies. Oh, great. Yeah, so where this came from is, is uh, you know, I saw your, your thread you posted on Twitter. Um, there is some good stuff on Twitter if you, if you look at it. I thought it was a great example of you know, what we should be doing more of in, in, in sport coaching and practice is taking, you know, a, you know, we'll talk about a drill that we do all the time for years and asking, why are we doing this? And is it actually achieving what, what we, um, what we want and, 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 and doing it in a very theoretically based and scientific way. And so, so can we start off with, so we're going to look at the Rondo. Can you tell us a little bit about, for those that don't know what a Rondo is and kind of what it's designed, people think it's achieving uh, when, when they do it. Yeah. So I know uh, my colleague, James Warren, Dr. James Warren in AIK, Mm -hmm. he he did his PhD on Spanish uh, football culture. And uh, so he defined Rondo as a training exercise design where you have, um, uh, overload of players in possession against the underloaded side out of possession who wants to get the ball by tackling or intercepting. And the goal of the players in possession is to keep the ball. That's the goal of a rondo. It's not the goal is not to dribble over a line or into a scoring zone or scoring goals. It's to keep possession. So that is a rondo by definition. So it could be could be four versus two. It could be eight versus five. Uh, it could be the pitch could be uh, uh, long, uh, wide. It doesn't matter. It's just if it if the aim is to keep possession, and if you have more players in the possession team than the defensive team, then it's a run. Yeah. So it's generally like a group of players around the outside, and so usually in a circle, right? And trying to pass each other in a 
Not always, you're right. There's but and then a group they of... could they could be inside as well. Yeah, you can have a link players inside. So the most oh. famous rondo in your time is the four versus four plus three. So you have one one neutral player on each side and one neutral player in the middle. That's famous by Pep Guardiola, the Manchester mm-hmm. City coach. Um, and here in Norway, we use this four versus two, where each player has his own side and there's two defenders in the middle trying to get the ball. Okay. That's the most famous rondo here in Norway. Okay. Um, I, you know, connecting it to, you know, a, a, a game we play as kids, it's a very fancy version of monkey in the middle, right? <laughs> Where yeah, someone's trying to get a ball away from people yeah. passing it around, right? So, um, so yeah, as, and as you say, like, it's very, very commonly used drill in, in football, right? Um, you know, I can, you see it all the time. Um, so... We mentioned a little bit about, uh, you know, what it, what it's trying to achieve. Kind of what are the principles of play it's trying to kind of in, enforce in players? Yeah, so it's mainly the, um, I would call it sub-sub principles or individual principles in attack. That's okay. uh, using my terminology. So that would be body position, open body position, receiving with the furthest foot, um, uh, passing, uh, attracting pressure and then passing at the right time, passing with both feet, uh, moving to support play. So it's a lot of attacking principles okay. uh, in, in small areas. And then you can you can coach the defensive principles like um, cover shadows. You don't want any passes going through you. You want the passes to go around you instead. Um, so... Yeah, but uh, as I try to problematize in the thread, it lacks a certain amount of the key principles uh, in a football game, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. so you you mentioned you kind of started out with the challenge. I think the phrase you use is why coaches should fall out of love with a rondo. Um, So did you (laughs) you kind of... Um, you, did you kind of start with the idea that it had some kind of limitations and you wanted to analyze it? Is that kind of where you started with your PhD? Yeah, so it's important to note that this um, was an assignment given to me by the PhD committee when okay. I made my uh, public defense. So okay. uh, we in Norway, you get an assignment two weeks before your public defense. It's called a trial lecture. Okay. And you have to pass this trial lecture uh, and I had great opponents. I had Keith Davids and Mark Williams. You probably know both mm-hmm. of them. Uh, very, uh, yes, very yeah, exciting but opponents. It's big so time. They yeah. me, <laughs> so they gave me this assignment. assignment um, mm-hmm. uh, why football coaches should fall out of love with rondos. But they didn't just p- uh, pluck it out from thin air. I actually wrote that sentence in my PhD. Okay. Uh, as a discussion point on one of my points on visual perception and no scanning in rondos and we we can uh, dive into that later but so that was the assignment uh, and i tried to attack that from a scientific point of view uh, using uh, mostly ecological dynamics and and concepts in um, constraints led approach which i'm a very big fan of mm-hmm. uh, but i also tried to look from the cognitive side as well Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it's it's mainly about specificity and transfer of learning uh, uh, and representative training design and intention session intention and so yeah so I so you, you that's wow <laughs> so this was kind of an add on to the work work you've already done <laughs> yeah so, so I actually I actually contemplated putting it out much earlier but I was actually afraid that <laughs> this would create so much controversy that I would lose. <laughs> hundreds of followers and uh but but i i just had to for me it's it's a start of a discussion it's not like i had to uh do rondo i could i could uh, dive into uh unopposed passing exercises for instance mm-hmm. it would be the same i could look at small sided games in the same way but this was just an assignment given to me and uh it started i have always used rondos myself Mm-hmm. Uh, but I started to think more about it. And I have to admit, at this time, I uh, using the constraints led approach in a couple of years, I, I went away from the traditional rondos. Uh, so at this point in November 2021, when I wrote this, uh, uh, prepared this trial lecture, I had moved away from rondos okay. uh, in a bit, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, Carl. I think, you know, the purpose of this is not to like... Tr- 
crash on, you know, dribbling around cones or what things we tend to do. It's right. We should be doing this for all the activities we're doing, even like the ones that are more ecological, like small sided games. I think asking why and is it getting what we want? And I think it's a great way to do it. So, so let's dive in maybe. So I know you, you tackled it from a lot of different angles. Maybe we could start with kind of the represent, uh, representative training, you know, um, we, I guess you could start, you know, our, so one of the principles of, I think, representative, representative training is we want kind of action, well, information to be the same, specifying information and action fidelity. So I think you mm. looked at that a bit, right? Like looked at kind of the movements and the, the kind of movement solutions people come up with in a rondo and how that compares to the action game. Can you talk a little bit about it from that angle? Yeah, and I like this sentence. I don't know if it was from Renshaw or Button, but uh, the practice environment, it has to, uh, you have to see the same, it has to have the same visual inputs, you have to hear the same things, like the auditory inputs, and you have to feel like the environment you are performing in a game, like the haptic. Uh, it has to be similar. And the perfection, the perception action couplings has to be similar to the performance couplings, mm -hmm. uh, to the performance environment. And in order to get this high transfer uh, from the practice environment to the performance environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I question whether Rondo do that, in particular, the lack of direction mm -hmm. or the lack of inherent direction, because a lot of coaches use these um, link players on each side so who only plays for the attacking team. And that would simulate a sort of direction because you want the play moving from one link player to the other. Mm -hmm. So you're playing from one side to the other. And that simulates some sort of direction and makes it more representative, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still not inherently directed. Um, the, the design uh, is not you're attacking that way and you're defending that way. It, it moves. Okay. It fluctuates. Okay. And uh, are, are would you, you may say, you know, it's lacking affordance kind of, you know, it's you know, what's your, what are you, what you're trying to achieve? You know, I get just keeping the ball away by, and not moving it and advancing it. Um, mm. I guess happens sometimes, but right. You're right. It's not very representative of what you're trying to achieve in, in a lot of, no, yeah. cause you're removing a lot of affordances. So mm -hmm. you're actually putting this massive value on passing, mm -hmm. but you're moving, but you're removing uh, the value on dribbling, moving the ball, because you have more players in attack than it did in defense. So the need to dribble is gone in a rondo. Mm -hmm. You need to, because you have free players all the time. So mm -hmm. why would you dribble? And you're not going anywhere. You just want to keep possession. So you only want to find a free player with a pass. Mm -hmm. So you're removing a lot of affordances. So mm -hmm. the affordance landscape becomes very limited. Right. And that might go into the creativity because i also discuss creativity and mm -hmm. um maybe this makes uh, the session lack creativity because it's you're you're limiting so many movement solutions uh so many affordances in uh some sort of rondo yeah yeah, yeah i think it has a lot of like you know also like if you want to get in like skilled intentionality it's completely mm. lacking that right when i pass mm. i don't just want to prevent it being intercepted. I'm trying to break down, like I want to try to break down the, I hope they go a certain way, like yeah, yeah. And keep all, keep affordances open and right. And that all that's kind of not there. It's a single uh, affordance of not giving the ball away. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So you mentioned creativity. Did, can you tell like a little bit uh, more about that? You kind of looked at that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me to make a session environment that, um, fosters creativity extremely important. So I, I would never tell my players, I would put my players in a situation and we have principles of play, of course, but I would never tell a player that this is the only solution in one situation because uh, football is vastly complex. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a player-led sport, uh, not like, like the NFL with mm -hmm. you, which is a coach-led sport where everything is patterns. Mm -hmm. This is so dynamic. Mm -hmm. So football for me is the maybe the most dynamic sport. Um, so I, I will never give them an, one exact solution. I will create environments where uh, their skills can create new solutions that, that I never thought of because yeah. I never had, 
I never had the skills that my uh, striker has. He has the ability to do something that I never thought of. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't want to limit that opportunity. So, uh, so, so I, I encourage those type of um, uh, movements, uh, those type of uh, solutions that mm-hmm. I've never thought of. Okay. Uh, so, and I, so I was questioning whether, whether it fostered or limited creativity. Right. So you, you're kind of looking at how often people do like unique or uh, kind of low probability actions when you do a rondo and you don't get much of that at all, right? No, the, the versatility in the movements, the mm-hmm. efficacy of the movements, the originality that mm-hmm. comes in the movements, uh, how many attempts are made on different movement solutions. So for me, uh, the Rondo lacks all of those four components, which I think Santos, uh, in an article 2016, wrote about. These mm-hmm. four uh, things has to be uh, present in order to foster creativity. Right. So yeah, it's kind of effective solution, but maybe more mm-hmm. not not something that people do all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and I, mm-hmm. I get your point. Like soccer seems like you know winning and losing is often defined by creating a scoring opportunity. And you know, and then you breaking that something unique. Um, yeah, and cre- yeah, creative solutions in decisive moments. Yeah, is mm-hmm. often is often the difference between winning or losing. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I so, think that's a that's a really good point. And then um, another thing I know, I guess connecting to your work that your main PhD work, you looked at uh, visual scanning behavior in mm-hmm. and so can you tell us a little bit about you know yeah what you found what the rondo and also kind of what you've how it connects to your other work mm. yeah. so my phd consisted of four papers uh, published papers mm-hmm. all looking at 11 versus 11 football so okay. i wanted my attempt in that phd was to move uh, the research out of the laboratory mm-hmm. and only looking at it in 11 versus 11 okay to get to get results from the actual football match at the elite level so I did two studies with eye tracking in 11 versus 11 with a elite team, uh, the first of its kind. Uh, and I did uh, a couple of video analysis on scanning where we, where we film matches and then we're with 4K cameras. And then we're able to go close up uh, and look at the scanning frequency and scanning timing in professional matches. So, uh, so what we found was that scanning is uh, a big part of um a game um a player scans between three or seven times in the 10 seconds leading up to receiving the ball and we define a scan as every head movement away from the ball to look for information from teammates opponents space and so on Mm -hmm. so information important for the development of play uh, so we found that all the top players are doing this. And then we found that uh, there was a link between successful passes and a higher scan frequency. We found that in all our studies. Okay. So we also, f- so we, are, we have evidence throughout that this uh, affects the passing performance of players. Um, and then it was a study done in, I think, 2017 by some Dutch researchers who looked at the scanning frequency in different type of training exercises. Okay. And that's the study I'm referring to in that uh, Twitter thread because it's not published, but I have seen the results. And they found that there are practically no scanning in a four versus two rondo. No scanning. Mm-hmm. It's actually less scanning than in a passing exercise where a player is asked to play from point A to point B and point C without opponents. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what... <laughs> So, and then it goes up. So the most functional, the most scanning you find in a full game, and then almost the same in small-sided games, like four versus four or five versus five and so on. Okay. Uh, but that makes me question. So if everyone starts 20 minutes each training exercise with a four versus two rondo, where you get a lot of passes all the time, then you may be that training uh, so that training day, you're practicing passing behavior in a different way than you do Mm -hmm. in a game all the time. Because in a game, you're always scanning before receiving a pass. The best players are doing it. Watch a a Premier League game, look at the head of the midfielders, they're swiveling all the time. Mm -hmm. Look right before they receive the ball, they're performing a scan to check their back all the time. Mm -hmm. And this is never happening in a rondo. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to, I've seen some great examples of that. You know, you you see that they make this kind of looks like a blind, perfect pass without looking, 
but mm-hmm. obviously they they looked for they were scanning before they received the ball so that's yeah. how they yeah um yeah that's a great point like yeah in a rondo there's why would you look behind you and <laughs> like and oh, there's, there's no, no there's no important information behind no, you no, you you see everything in the peripheral vision you yeah. have you know where your teammate is to right you know where your teammate is to left you're seeing the, the two defenders or three defenders right in front of you so the need for scanning is gone yeah yeah, I think this is, like this all falls under you know something I've talked about in terms of simulation and VR. You need there's psychological fidelity. <laughs> like, mm. do you act in the same way? Do you focus mm. on the same things? Do you pick up the same information? You're right. That's so important for transfer. Um, you know, um, mm. it, 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 you know, especially at that high at that level, right? I guess you know with the, you can strip it down sometimes for on purposely, but yeah. But, of course, and, I, yeah. and you could work on the passing technique, but for me, a pass is the entire sequence of one player is passing to you, you are receiving the ball, and then you're passing to another. Mm-hmm. For me, that's the passing sequence, mm-hmm. and that always involves a scan at the highest level, Yeah, but that never happens in a rondo right. so and that that makes me question that and yeah. i i seem that's why i don't like it too much <laughs> because <laughs> i i'm not saying that uh it's like it's it's negative learning i'm just maybe it's not the best uh use of time because yeah. i think my practice time with my team is so important it's so um yeah it's so valuable mm-hmm. so how can i best use that time to make each player better, to make this team better. That's that's my starting point. Yeah. No, that that's a great point too, Carl. I get, you know, it'd be easy to organize a passing, a small rondo on your own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, being able to pick up the, you know, the affordances of creating, you know, an opportunity and scanning a large field. You know, you don't get those are off the field or <laughs> harder no, to read. No. Right. So it's taking advantage of of the the time you have available, I agree. Um, mm. I guess another um, aspect you kind of look, uh, looked at was kind of variability, you know, repetition without mm. repetition. Do people mm. um, use kind of redundancy? Do they do this different things in the same situations? Kind of, is, that, is that another area you kind of see lacking? Yeah, uh, Definitely. And you, you see the same passes all the time. And the passes are so short in a rondo often. Mm. So, mm. and it, it Again, it doesn't translate to the game playing on a full-size pitch. Even Manchester City, these short passes you see in a the game, they're actually much longer than you think. Yeah. Uh, but mm-hmm. but in a rondo, you're compressing the space so much that you're only performing these very, very small passes, maybe four or five meters long. Uh, while most passes you do in a game is 10 meters plus, maybe 10 to 20 meters. Yeah. Um, so again, what are you training? What are you what are you rehearsing <clears throat> in training? Um, is it an effective way of training? Uh, so for me, it's not enough variability. Uh, and of course, m- for me, repetition without repetition is an extremely important point when I'm planning my training. Mm. So I need them to get a lot of situations uh, playing against, for instance, a low block, which we call it a low defense. So I just give them a lot of opportunities to to play that way in different ways. So mm. play that situation again and again, but the the, the solutions of the players are different every time. Right. Uh, one time they're trying trying to make a two versus one on one side. Another time he maybe goes for a shot. Uh, the third time he maybe tries a dribble and then a pass to the other side. So you're creating these situations, but then it's just up to the players to find the effective movement solutions and effective passing sequences or dribbles or everything mm-hmm. based on their affordances right. that yeah. they see. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think you, you mentioned that in the thread, kind of guiding their intentions and attention to different, you know, opportunities and, and the, you know, affordances. I think you're right, is missing Um you mentioned you mentioned yeah um, kind of you looked at it from a cognitive side as well uh, you know I'm often <laughs> accused of being biased on the club so kind of <laughs> yeah. how did how did you think about it and kind of in that way uh, no I just started with uh, some research so the information processing approach mm-hmm. uh, the l- long term memory how how is um, how is learning taking place with the cognitive phase the associative phase and the autonomous phase. Uh, which has just been the, uh, yeah, it's been the dominant mm-hmm. uh, belief for so many years. 
So for me, it was a because most research has been done with that framework, that conceptualization. I just needed to start there, and then I moved quickly on to a more ecological way of thinking yeah. uh, about learning. So not skill acquisition, but I like the word skill adaptability um, mm. instead. For me, for sure. Yeah, for me, yeah. It's it's the that words the terms you, it's so ingrained and it's hard to get rid of. But it, <laughs> uh, ad, adapt uh, adaptation is a much better, you know, yeah. for sure. I, I agree. Um, um, even though I still use skill acquisition all the time because it's <laughs> yeah, just, me too. Yeah, me too. yeah, people. And the other, I guess, you know, in terms you talked a little bit also about transfer and specificity. Um, mm. You know, what it kind of did you, are your thoughts there? that's most important for me so i want from the moment we are finished uh doing our warm up uh having our bodies ready i want to work uh on the game so so everything we do is uh, opposed everything we do is with direction with goals um so the players are they're performing things that can transfer to our performance from the first moment so normally a coach would maybe do a passing exercise, maybe do a small rondo to get the, the bodies more ready, call it uh, traditionally, we would, would call it um, uh, a specific warm up, mm -hmm. like you have a general warm up and then a specific warm up. I just want, I just asked my physical coach to, can you make us ready to perform in 10 minutes mm -hmm. so that we have the re rest of the exercise time is used to become better at our playing style and to work individually and collectively to become better in different phases of the game. Mm -hmm. So I, I practice a lot attack versus defense. I practice a lot with using constraints. I use different constraints all the time, but we're playing. So I, I like to use vertical zones, horizontal zones to get different things, to create overloads, but it's, it's always directed. It's always against goals. Uh, it's always the post um, because, in my opinion, that's how you transfer everything we do into the performance environment. Yeah, no, I think that's it. Yeah, I heard someone say uh, recently, "Stay as close to the game as possible." Um, yeah. I really like. It's just a fact. Like I don't know, we 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 keep resisting the fact that if you want to get good at soccer, you have to play soccer, right? <laughs> there, everyone yeah. wants a shortcut. Um, where you can do something different. But the reality of all the transfer research tells you the way to get transfers, have it as close to possible to what you want to get in the end, right? It's just a reality. Yeah. It's And I really yeah. don't know why Yeah, not more coaches are doing it this way. Yeah. I think it's, it's so ingrained that you need to have some sort of specific warm-up, some yeah. sort of activity before you move on to the game. Yeah, that's just that's just how it is. It's just that's just how you do it. Yeah, and I disagree completely because and and the main argument when I came here, I told um, the people who was hiring me, I told I'm never going to do a four versus two rondo. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I said that. I said that in the interview, and they said, "No, you can't do that. You can't remove the <laughs> rondo. They love it. It's the most fun activity they have." And then I tell them, players love to play the game. Mm -hmm. They love to score goals. They love to compete. Uh, I'm sure I can make another uh, session design, exercise design, as fun as the Rondo. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I've been here in seven months. I've never heard the players once ask for a Rondo. Because I always explain why we're doing things to the players as well. Mm -hmm. So when we go through the session, I show them, okay, we're doing this. And I ask them, why do you think we're using this constraint for this exercise? Mm -hmm. Why do you think? And then now they know my thinking. So they say, okay, yeah, this would make uh, our team um, more together in the defensive phase. So for instance, I use the constraints like uh, we have to have all our players across the halfway line when we score a goal, then you get two goals for that goal. So that okay. goal count doubles. Mm -hmm. So I don't remove the normal goal. You get one goal for a normal goal. But if the entire team is over the halfway line, uh, meaning that we have a compact team. So if we lose the ball, it's easier for us to win the ball back. And we score with our entire team over the halfway line, we get two goals. That would be one constraint. Um, another constraint I use is I tell maybe the attacking team, uh, in this game, you're not allowed to speak. Not one single word when you have the ball. <laughs> 
And what you see then is you see a lot more scanning because mm -hmm. now you, your teammate is not telling you where your pressure is coming from uh, and things like that. And then the team in defense are talking a lot more than usual because <laughs> they're allowed to speak now. <laughs> uh, so, so I love to use those different kind of constraints, but it's always attached to, to one specific goal. I want some affordances to shine brighter. That's the... That's yeah, the main benefit. I do. Yeah, I, I like to like amplify. You know, you're not yeah. you're not creating this artificial thing where that's the only thing you can do. You no. can still do all the other stuff. You, they're not not. Yeah, restrict. I, I don't yeah. like saying uh, we can't score a normal goal. Uh, yeah. I don't like that at all. But I like to give maybe extra. Uh, yeah. extra goals for some sort of specific uh, attacking pattern or some sort of not yeah. a pattern I don't like the word pattern <laughs> because yeah. but uh, yeah. yeah you know yeah I think so, you're like yeah. you know using the term you used before like the affordance landscape still all there it's just mm. making one of them more attractive mm. um, you know or, or shining a light on it or you know yeah. whatever analogy you want to use I think that, but they're all still there right that's I yeah. think that's really important for you know, intention and skilled intentionality that, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So, um, <coughs> so what a question are you, what do you do when you want to, if you do want to work kind of with an individual player, like if you identified mm. something, you know, say you set up a small side game and the individual player, you know, their passing was really inaccurate or I don't know how much mm. at your level, you probably, you know, don't get too much of that, but is there a way that you would kind of constrain that? Or, or how, how would you handle that? I have used like individual task constraints uh, previously. Like I could tell a player that uh, for this training, when you have, uh, for this specific training, when you have more than five meters, I want you to turn uh, every time you get the ball. Okay. For instance, so I could give him this uh, verbal task constraint. Uh, I don't use that too much. Uh, if I, in a session, that was your... Uh, uh, point like in a session i observed that one player is not performing um i would perhaps start with uh how how are your space do you have enough space to receive the ball mm -hmm. um where should you be in this situation where is much more space uh and then maybe how is your body position related to the what you want to achieve mm -hmm. so i would maybe ask some questions make him think um i don't think i would add or remove a constraint uh, there and then based mm -hmm. on that player uh, because the constraints are already in the exercise. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would make him, uh, yeah, uh, I would make him think and I, I would direct his attention. If he's not able to uh, mm -hmm. do that himself, I would direct his attention to important things like, okay, n you don't have enough space to receive the ball. That's why you, uh, you get uh, less time than normal. And that's why you're missing the pass. Right. Uh, or, or, or maybe the problem is the technical execution. Then, for me, that's um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go and correct that. I would let him experience the situation again and again and again. For me, that is learning. Mm. He's, uh, yeah. Uh, if you then see that uh, the next situation he receives the ball, maybe is a slightly better positioning, mm -hmm. and then uh, he makes the pass. And then, for me, that is the session design, and he adapting to the environment, um, mm. self-organizing. So no, I wouldn't just, I, I, I never correct each mistake. I would never do that. Um, yeah. No, no like, like, in you know, it's, not, it's a great, you know, you're teaching someone you have to pass with the inside of your foot like this. No, no, no. <laughs> then you get rid of all the creative back foot yeah, chip, yeah. you know, you know, it, 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 you're right. It, it's kind of this, you know, this fundamentals idea, you know, that, yeah, but, uh, you know, yeah, but yeah I, I, you know, I think, you know, I think some people struggle with that, but, you know, letting it happen. But I, 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 I think you should at the very least start there, <laughs> like start mm. in the game. And if you don't like something you see, then maybe yeah. work on technical things. Don't. Yeah. Cause I yeah. love that saying the knowledge of football mm -hmm. versus the knowledge in football. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that saying because I could stand out there and tell him uh, you have to do that and you have to do that and the, but letting him experience it, letting him feel those and see those spaces himself uh, and developing the knowledge in the game. That's uh, that's my why I'm, what I'm attempting, uh, creating dexterous players. Uh, that That is my goal. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. That's um, 
So when you kind of are planning these activities yourself, like, you know, you mentioned the, the not being able to talk um, on the offense, mm. do you kind of, you kind of start with, here's what I'm the principal or the affordance I'm hoping to amplify then kind of, okay, what can I do? <laughs> what can, yeah. can I, I think that's the kind of the, instead of just randomly picking, okay, we're going to make half the field with no real reason. <laughs> um, no, yeah. it's always goes back to what are we trying to achieve for this specific uh, training exercise? And it's, uh, it's always paradised. And so for instance, uh, three days before a game, I mainly work on uh, attacking principles. Mm -hmm. That would be the normal way for us to do it. So attacking principles in larger surfaces, and then I make constraints. So maybe we're working on playing out from the back controlled uh, creating what I call a plus one. So we want one more player in our team in that um, uh, that place on the pitch to easily get uh, through the pressure of the opponent. And then maybe I make a zone and I'm telling uh, there the opponent is only allowed to press with three players in that zone. Mm -hmm. So the players can then make use of this uh, numerical advantage to advance the play. Mm -hmm. But they don't have to. So they can move down to support the play, but they don't have to. So, so that would be the starting point. Uh, what are we working on for this session? Then what kind of surfaces, what areas are we playing on small surfaces, uh, medium, large surfaces, uh, large areas? And then I, I think about the constraints that can help us to achieve this goal and to make players, um, yeah, to, to enhance the learning in that particular exercise. Yeah. No, I think that's that's really good. So, yeah, maybe kind of like so to kind of wrap things up. I guess you know, as I said, I think this is a great way, a thing we should be doing all the time, kind of this. So, I guess yeah. like, if we were doing like a checklist for evaluating a practice activity, you know, so we want like the fidelity, the actions to movements and scanning and information mm. to be as similar as possible mm. to the game. Um, mm. We want um, multiple affordances <laughs> um, mm. and, uh, you know, I think, and, and intention. Is there kind of, is, is that kind of, I think I'm trying to think of all the ways you kind of analyze it. I think that's a good. No, no but yeah. I, I usually tell my players and mm. you players coming in that my ambition is to give you uh, hundreds of situations mm. each training week that you will encounter in a match. Mm hmm with the same intensity, the same pressure uh, that you will encounter in a match. That is my ambition. Mm -hmm. And I think all training and the training week should uh, include that as a thought, as, a, as an idea. Yeah, I know. I like, I think the, the quote, you know, it's a not, not learning is not a process of repeating a solution. It's a process of repeating finding a solution <laughs> to all yeah. the problems you get you to, you yeah, know, that's and that's the adaptability that's i really you know so i yeah i think i think thinking about it that way and um yeah no i think it's a it's a really interesting way so so yeah i, I would encourage you you have a i put a link to the, i'll put a link to your the twitter thread you go through kind of step by step what you found and and kind of link it to the thing so i, I encourage people everyone to have a look at it i think it's a great case study example of what we should be doing in a lot of other sports. And so um, thanks for, for joining me, Carl. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay. That's it for today's episode. Remember you can contact me at Rob Gray at ASU.edu or follow me on Twitter at shaky weights to find out more about the podcast. Please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone through San Luis.